So having learned about the basic building blocks, we're now in a position to take a look at price patterns themselves. Price patterns are reversal formations at market tops and are called distribution patterns at market bottoms. When we look at any price chart, sometimes we'll see prices go straight up and straight down. But in most situations, what happens is prices move up as the buyers are in control, and then we get some kind of a trading range as there's a balance between buyers and sellers, and then the price comes down as the sellers get control, and vice versa. And it's these transitional periods which we observe in technical anal analysis and look at certain price patterns or price configurations, which give us a clue that the balance has now tipped from the bulls to nobody over to the bears, or from the bears to nobody and then to the bulls. So this is what we mean when we talk about distribution patterns, is the idea that prices are, are, are moving up, and as um, the informed sellers are anticipating, or the informed traders, I should say, investors are anticipating uh, the downside or, or decline in profits if it's a stock, so they're feeding out or distributing stock to the less uh, informed people, and that's what gives us what we call a distribution pattern. Whereas at the bottom, the intelligent, or the, I shouldn't say the intelligent, but the smarter traders and investors are anticipating the next recovery or the next rally, and so they accumulate during this period of transition, and they're accumulating from the people who are looking at all the bad news, and, the, and, the, intel and they, the, the smarter people are anticipating the good news down the road, which is, of course, why markets move ahead of the fundamentals. So reversal formations at market bottoms are called accumulation patterns, and at tops they're called distribution patterns. Now we're going to talk a little bit about one of the price patterns, and that's rectangles. And we're going to use rectangles as kind of a case study because the principles of price pattern interpretation can really be applied to all the patterns. So we use the rectangles to explain how that can be. What we have here is a rally, and then uh, at this point here we see a rally and a reaction, and we can get some idea at this point here that maybe we're, in, we're getting into a bit of a trading range market. So what we can start to do is to draw a resistance trend line uh, against the two highs, because remember from our support and resistance analysis that the previous high is a place for anticipating resistance, and here's a previous low, so we could anticipate that that is a possible support point. So once again, we can draw the line, and then the price um, action continues, and we can see that the lines are continually being touched. What we're getting here is a battle between buyers and sellers. So every time it comes up to the brown line, the sellers get in control, and every time it comes down to the other brown line, at the lower line, um, people think it's a bargain, and uh, they start to buy. So the upper line becomes one of resistance, going back to our support resistance concept, and the lower line becomes one of support, and then eventually something happens to change that balance that, between buyers and sellers, and the price breaks through the support. So at this point here, the breakout signals a trend reversal. And that's what we call a rectangle. Here we see a rectangle at the bottom. When the price comes down, we get a trading range. We can draw two approximate parallel lines. And when the price breaks out on the upside, uh, that indicates that the trend has changed. And of course, going back to our idea of peak and trough analysis, it's nothing more in, 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 a, in this sense here than a reversal of declining peaks and troughs to a period of rising peaks and troughs, because when the price each time the price comes down to here, it fails to take out this low here. And when it goes through this line here, it's taking out all these highs. So now we have a series of rising peaks and troughs. So really, a rectangle is nothing more than a, a reversal of rising peaks and troughs following a trading range. Here's another rectangle. And this time, the price breaks to the upside. So just as um, trend line violations can be followed by reversals or consolidations, so price patterns can be of the reversal type, or they can be of the consolidation type. So the breakout on the upside makes it a continuation rectangle. And it also confirms a series of rising peaks and troughs. Price patterns come with measuring implications. And the idea here is you look at the depth of any price pattern and project the depth in the direction of the breakout. So in this case here, we're measuring the um, depth between the high and the low of the pattern. And that's our measurement. And then we take that measurement and we whip it up there. And that becomes our price projection. That becomes the minimum ultimate upside objective. It could go much further than that, but this is the minimum expected. 
And it doesn't have to happen in the first move. It could happen in, over several moves. In this case here, the price reaches the objective immediately and then shoots skyward. So here we see the objective again, but this time what happens is the price fails to reach the objective because it is an ultimate objective and it experiences a retracement move. And that's often, again, going back to our idea of emotion because what happens on the breakout, typically you get a lot of excitement and prices move up sharply. And when you get people too excited, they tend, as I mentioned, in this, uh, I gave you in this analogy about the people having the argument in, in, in the previous um, presentation, that you tend to come back to the same emotional point to where you start. And the same thing happens too with the breakouts. Quite a lot of the time, you'll get a retracement move back to the body of the pattern again. And then the price moves up. So here's the price objective from a downside projection. Pattern length is also important. In this example here, we've got the CRB composite, a commodity index, and you can see that it's in a trading range, a multi-year rectangle going from, what, 1957 up to 1972. Well, the bigger the pattern, the longer the pattern, obviously the greater the battle between the buyers and sellers. And once that battle is resolved, then you tend to get a much more significant trend once the breakout takes place. In this case here, we had a dramatic rise in commodity prices. There was really no way of forecasting that you were going to get such a dramatic rise out of this pattern. Merely that this pattern represented a trading range for a long period of time, and that prices were likely to move significantly higher, more significantly than just, say, the minimum ultimate upside objective. But no way of, of predicting that you'd have such an explosive breakout out of the pattern. But it is an example of how a longer, the longer the pattern, the greater the significance when the breakout comes. Let's take a look at volume characteristics as applied to price patterns. What we see is during the uptrend, the buyers are in control. And during the formation of the price pattern, nobody is in control. And as the price pattern is formed, so there tends to be less and less interest in that particular security. And so volume on a trend basis tends to decline. And here you can see volume is zigzagging up and down. But on a trend basis, overall, the pattern is experiencing a declining level of volume, a declining level of um, enthusiasm. And then we get the breakout. On the breakout from a downside, um, on the downside, uh, prices can fall of their own volition or they can expand. If they expand on the, break, on the downside breakout, that tends to emphasize the fact that the sellers are in control and it's a stronger signal. But it doesn't matter whether volume expands or contracts on the downside breakout. A downside breakout is just that, a downside breakout. And usually we look for a, uh, in the old days when we're looking at weekly and monthly charts and long-term daily charts, we looked at a, a, um, a 3% as a uh, decisive breakout to the downside. But obviously when we're looking at intraday charts, 3% can be twice the move we're looking for. So a 3% rule doesn't apply to um, very short-term charts. You just have to use common sense as to what looks on the chart to be a decisive breakout. It, it's just a question of uh, trial and error and judgment as to what, what, what is a, uh, what is a um, decisive breakout. And then this example here, what we get, because this is a bear trend, we get a retracement move, but what, how do we recognize that that's a normal retracement move? Well, we rec recognize it by the fact that the price is going up and the volume is shrinking. So as the price is coming up, the volume is shrinking, which indicates that prices are going up more as a lack of, because of lack of sellers than the enthusiasm of buyers. So volume should decline on a retracement move, which takes place maybe 40 or 50% of the time. So here we have a breakout. We saw a breakout from the downside. Now we're going to see a breakout from the upside. You can see volume again during a reversal um, accumulation pattern rectangle. Volume contracts as the pattern is formed. But it should increase on the breakout. This is more important for volume to increase on the breakout from a price pattern that's a bullish price pattern. So maybe we can get a bit more volume going in there. Yes, we can. Um, that's what the classic textbooks tell us, that volume has to expand on the, on the breakout. And I recently did a, I wrote a book on price patterns. And I did a lot of research into looking at price patterns and what was happening on the breakout. And I found out that volume wasn't that important. It didn't have to break out that, that much. Uh, on the upside. If it does break out, that if we're looking at sort of patterns and we're giving them um, 
stars for the quality of the pattern. This will give us an extra couple of stars if the volume really expands noticeably. But it's amazing how many good price patterns uh, break out with, with relatively no increase in volume, maybe a slight increase in the volume. The one thing to bear in mind, though, is if you get a, pre a breakout taking place on the upside and volume noticeably contracts, then that indicates that the price is going up because of a lack of bids, not because of enthusiasm on buyers, and that makes it suspect. So I would advise not to buy on a price pattern breakout where the volume is declining. But just because the volume doesn't expand doesn't mean to say you shouldn't look at that price pattern. If it does expand noticeably, so much the better. It gives you those extra stars. So here we see a rectangle uh, of the Swiss franc, a uh, little rally, and then a breakout to the downside there. So a quick summary of rectangles and price patterns in general. Uptrends and downtrends are normally separated by a trading range, which often takes the form of a recognizable price pattern. Price patterns are either of the reversal or continuation formations. Reversal patterns at peaks are known as distribution formations at market bottoms. They're known as accumulation. Patterns offer price objectives when completed, and these objectives are often exceeded. Now we'll take a look at the head and shoulders, which is a notorious pattern. Um, it's a very uh, reliable pattern. Uh, we did some research on price patterns, and we looked at 5,000 different price patterns, um, most of which were head and shoulders, or a substantial number was head and shoulders, and we found out they work a considerable amount of the time. So price patterns are a pretty reliable price pattern. A head and shoulders top consists of a final rally separated by two smaller rallies. The final rally is the head, and the two smaller rallies are what we call the shoulders. So here we see a rally, and we see a, re a reaction, and this will eventually turn out to be the left shoulder. Then we make a higher high. So at this point here, you see your peaks and troughs are still in a rising phase, but the price comes back down again and tests, and tests the low. So at this point here, we've still got a series of rising peaks and rising troughs, and that peak there becomes the head. Then we see a, another rally, which is the right shoulder. So we have the left shoulder and the right shoulder. And then we can draw a line that joins the two lows together. That's known as the neckline. Neckline, again, is a trend line. So when the price breaks below the neckline, it confirms that we now have a series of declining peaks and troughs, and it's also breaking a support level as marked by that trend line. So we have two building blocks in here which, which work for the head and shoulders top. So the break then becomes um, the sell signal. Once again, it's possible to get a retracement move from a head and shoulders top, and then price moves down. So in other words, if you, uh, if you wanted to go short and you missed this move here, this is a very intelligent place to be going short because if the price moves back above this resistance here, then that it indicates some doubt as to whether or not this head and shoulders pattern is going to form. So that would be a good place for placing a stop. So you could go short here and have a relatively low risk trade for potentially a lot of reward. Measuring implications are very similar as we have with the rectangles. Measure the maximum depth of the pattern, which is the distance between the head and the neckline, and then project that distance down. Volume considerations. Volume is usually heaviest on the right shoulder, and it can be light or heavy at the head. So the idea then again is that volume leads price. So on the left shoulder, volume is expected to be much heavier than it is on the head. Sometimes they're about the same, but usually the volume would be higher on the left shoulder than the head. So we can give the head a bit more volume there, if you like. Then on the right shoulder, this is the tip-off that a head and shoulders pattern may be forming, because now, if that's the head and that's the top of the bull market, then the characteristics of a bull market would change to one of a bear market or a bear trend. So what we would expect to see is as we get the rally going into the right shoulder, we would expect to see, if this is a bearish rally, volume contract because of a lack of sellers, and that's what happens in that situation there. Head and shoulders come in several different types, different variations. Before we saw uh, the neckline was a horizontal line, it's possible to have an upward sloping neckline like this one here, and that's what we, we call it, upward sloping head and shoulders. And the, and the objectives are the same. We take the maximum distance between the top and the bottom of the pattern and project it in the direction of the breakout, which in this case is a downside objective, downside breakout, which would give us that move down to there. 
Here is a downward sloping head and shoulders. And you can see here, once again, we can take the objective by taking the maximum distance between the head and the neckline and projecting that down. We have to be a bit careful when we're drawing these downward sloping head and shoulders because if this trend line is a very steep one, then obviously by the time you get the breakout, most of the move or a substantial part of the move has probably taken place. So it's not one that you would want to necessarily act on if you were going short. Price patterns come in, uh, I should say the head and shoulders come in different varieties to more complex varieties. Here we have a complex head and shoulders because here's the head and shoulders. And in this case here, we have multiple shoulders on the left, multiple shoulders on the right, and the head itself is a head and shoulders pattern. So just think about this. We've got a battle between buyers and sellers as indicated by the head and shoulders pattern, but we've got several sub uh, patterns uh, going on at the same time, several sub battles going on. So this makes the pattern much more significant. The more you whipsaw people around, the greater the significance of the breakout when it comes. So a complex pattern is more significant, generally speaking, than a simple pattern because a complex pattern re represents a lot of complex battles that are going on. So once that is resolved, it tends to be much more decisive when it happens. Head and shoulders can also be of the consolidation variety. We saw that with trend lines earlier. So that with rectangles, we can see that too with head and shoulders. And the price objectives and so forth remain the same. Here's an example of a head and shoulders chart using uh, March 2003 sugar. And there's the breakdown. Uh, very obviously pretty clean, pretty easy to make money on that one if you went short. Head and shoulders also occur at market bottoms, in which case they're called reverse or inverse head and shoulders. But the principle is the same. With the head and shoulders, we had the final rally separated by two smaller rallies. With the reverse head and shoulders, we have the final low separated by two, lower low, two higher lows. There's the left shoulder, there's the head, the right shoulder, and then we have the neckline. And the measuring implications are very similar. We take the depth of the pattern and project it up. So there's the depth of the pattern, project that up, and that becomes our minimum ultimate upside objective. In this case here, we get a breakout to the upside. The price comes down below the breakout point. So you have to ask yourself the question at that point, does this represent a reversal? Because the price is now below the breakout point. There's the breakout point, and that's where the price is. The answer is no, not at this point here, because we still have the series of rising peaks and troughs. Because when you break out from a reverse head and shoulders with a more or less horizontal trend line, that represents, again, a signal of a reversal of downward peaks and troughs to upward peaks and troughs. Just as uh, the, uh, downwards, the, uh, the head and shoulders tops come in variations, so the head and shoulders bottoms come in variations, here's an idea of a complex reverse head and shoulders. And here, again, the head itself is a reverse head and shoulders. Much more significant pattern than the other ones I was showing for the inverse head and shoulders. Once again, inverse head and shoulders can be consolidation patterns. So here I have the uptrend, the inverse head and shoulders, and then the breakout. There's the upside objective, the measuring implication, and the upside objective. Volume considerations. What we want to see on a head and shoulders pattern is when the breakout comes, again, to give it five stars or three stars, we want to see volume expand. It doesn't have to expand. Um, like with the rectangle the example I showed you, it doesn't have to expand, but it's much better if it does expand. So let, let's make this into a better example and get some volume into it. So it's better for volume to expand noticeably like this. If you get this, this is a really good, strong signal. What you don't want to see is if, uh, well, let's say that point there was the breakout point and volume shrunk to almost nothing. That would indicate, as I said before, um, a lack of buying interest, uh, a lack of selling interest rather than an uh, enthusiasm from buyers. So we want to see a lot of volume take place on the breakout. Sometimes you'll find that the left shoulder or the head volume expands significantly into a selling climax type of situation. If that happens, that obviously gives credibility to the pattern. But the most significant thing is for volume either to expand noticeably or certainly not to contract on the breakout. So here we see a nice example of uh, a chart we saw before with the head and shoulders top on the left. Now we're seeing a reverse head and shoulders on the right. 
with a nice, a nice breakout there. And there's the measuring objective, and you can see that that was truly exceeded. And we see a reverse head and shoulders for gold on a daily chart. And once again, what's interesting is we get the retracement move, the breakout here, and then a retracement move. So if you were bullish on gold and you'd missed this exciting move here, you could have bought again down at the support level. And then we see a reverse head and shoulders. In this case, it's a consolidation because it occurs approximately halfway up the trend. And there's our measuring objective. And we can take that up. And you can see it was well exceeded. In fact, in this example here, it almost got to twice the measuring objective. And this is something I didn't mention before, but sometimes you can make the measuring objectives or the multiples thereof become potential support or resistance levels. So if it, if it exceeds the first objective, then the next place to look for a possible reversal will be the second uh, price objective. And here we see an example of a reverse head and shoulders for uh, silver. It's an hourly chart. And you can see the price breaks out, and then uh, it breaks back below this trend line again. Well, that becomes a false break at that point there, or an apparent false break. So let's suppose you'd bought here. What you would have had to have done before you bought is to say to yourself, well, just in case this breakout isn't going to work, where should I place my stop? Because in this case here, it doesn't work. So what you would do is you would place, you would find an intelligent place for putting a stop. And in this case here, it would be below this trend line because it's a, it's a line which has been touched or approached on numerous occasions. And uh, it's not that shallow, it's not that steep an angle of ascent. So whenever you get into a trade, I think it's very important not to look at the profit, but to look at the downside risk first of all and say to yourself, well, just in case the market changes its mind, because I recognize that people change their minds, so the market's made up of people, so why can't the market change its mind? Where am I going to place the stop? And an intelligent place to put a stop is below a, a potential support or resistance level, uh, below a potential support level. And a trend line is a dynamic level of support, so you place it below that trend line just there. Now we look at triangles. There are two types of triangles. There's what we call a symmetrical type and the right-angled type. We'll first of all look at symmetrical. Triangles uh, appear a lot of times on the chart, probably more than head and shoulders patterns. That's the good news. The bad news is they tend to be less, far less reliable than head and shoulders, and we'll get into some of those examples a little later. But the idea with a symmetrical triangle is you, how you can draw a trend line joining two peaks and two troughs, and the two trend lines uh, converge. So that's where the triangle starts, and the apex is theoretically where it finishes. And the classic text would have us believe that if the breakout takes place between one half and two thirds of the distance between the start of the triangle and the apex, you tend to get a better and more reliable breakout. A triangle, as I mentioned, can be, can, uh, be constructed by just joining two trend lines uh, on the two highs and two lows. Personally, I prefer to see a trend line where at least one of those trend lines has been touched more than twice. Because as we mentioned before, a trend line is nothing more than a dynamic level of support or resistance. So if the trend lines are going to be a stronger, more significant for a triangle, I want to see them touch a lot more than twice. Three, yes, four would be ideal. Because the more times it's been touched, obviously the greater the potential for the reliability of the breakout when it takes place. Here we see a triangle formed at the top. And look at the volume contraction, the volume uh, action. Volume more so with triangles, I think, because triangles, the price range is gradually getting smaller and smaller and smaller, indicating a fine balance between buyers and sellers. I think triangles more than, say, rectangles or head and shoulders should experience a real contraction of volume um, as they are uh, completed or formed. Here's an example using a bottom triangle. Once again, the volume is contracting as the, as the triangle is forming. And then on the breakout, it's nice to see some volume uh, increase as the, as the triangle is forming. I would say it's more significant for a triangle because than the other patterns because triangles, as I mentioned before, are less reliable than head and shoulders. And um, so we want to see more evidence on the breakout. We want to see evidence in terms of the trend lines being touched more often. And on the breakout on the upside, we want to see some more action in terms of expanding volume. 
Here we see a symmetrical triangle which acts as a consolidation on the way up here. So triangles can be reversal type, just like head and shoulders and rectangles, or they can be consolidation. Measuring implications. Well, the classic way of measuring a triangle is to take the top of the, of the, of the, um, of the triangle uh, and draw a line parallel with the bottom of the triangle like that, and that becomes the measuring line. So you would extend the measuring line and the price should eventually touch the measuring line, and that's the measuring implication. Here's the same thing on a down tri a triangle uh, at a bottom, where you draw a line from the bottom to the top of the triangle, a parallel line, and then extend that trend line because that becomes the measuring objective line, and then the price eventually should get to that measuring line. That's the way the classic text told us to measure the um, uh, objective from a rectangle. Personally, I feel the way we used uh, measuring objectives for re rectangles for head and shoulders is a better way of doing it because I find often the measuring line of a triangle is more often than not well exceeded and it doesn't be really become much of a, a useful concept. So the idea here would be to take the distance, the maximum distance in the top and the bottom of the pattern and then uh, project that down and that will become our measuring objective. And the same thing for a reversal. Here we have the top, from the bottom to the top, and then project that up. That becomes our measuring objective. As I mentioned before, triangles tend to be um, uh, misleading and sometimes in their breakouts. They can, they can be unreliable. So here's the sort of thing which can happen. We've got a a trend line forming here, a solid trend line, a dashed trend line. There's our triangle, and the price breaks to the upside. So it looks like a good, solid breakout. It's not far, far enough away from the apex, as I would like to see, but it's, it's, it's definitely a breakout because you're breaking above that dashed green line. But what happens in this situation here is that the price breaks below the green trend line eventually, and that turns out to be a kind of a head and shoulders top. And this is the kind of thing you have to watch out with triangles. Be very careful. And whenever you buy anything, as I mentioned before, it's always a good idea to, to look and say, well, if the market goes against me, where am I going to get out? You need to look much more closely with a triangle because you're more likely to run into failures with triangles than other patterns. So that was a symmetrical triangle. Now we look at the right angle triangle. Because with a symmetrical triangle, we get no indication of which way the price is likely to break. With a right angle triangle, it gives us some indication of which way the price is likely to break. So with the right angle triangle, what we have is one line is horizontal and the other line is sloping. They're still converging like the symmetrical triangle, but one line is horizontal. And the horizontal line indicates the way the price is likely to break. Or I should say that the, the, uh, the sloping line indicates the way the price is likely to break. In this case, the line is sloping down and that indicates that the price is likely to break to the downside. Once again, as with symmetrical triangles and the other patterns, we expect to see volume on a contracting basis, on a contracting trend as the pattern is developing. Because once again, we see our battle between buyers and sellers is gradually getting less and less ferocious as the rallies get less and they find support at the same level. So the volatility is going down and we would expect the activity to go down. And on the breakout, it doesn't matter whether volume expands or contracts. If it expands on a downside breakout, that emphasizes the breakout. But prices can fall of their own free will in a downside, in a declining trend. So volume characteristics are not quite so important on the downside breakout as they are on the upside. So that's a bearish right angle triangle. Now we look at a bullish right angle triangle. And here the horizontal line is not support as it was on the downside. It now becomes one of resistance. And it's a sloping line which becomes the support line. Once again, the volume should shrink as the pattern is formed. And we would like to see, uh, because triangles are less reliable, we want to see some volume expanding on the upside breakout. In this case here, we get a retracement move uh, right back to the body of the pattern again. And notice during the retracement move that the volume is contracting, which is, which is normal. Volume is expanding on the upside and contracting on the downside, which is normal bull market or bullish activity. But one of the great things about retracements is sometimes you can 
you can draw a trend line joining uh, all the peaks. And let's suppose that you didn't uh, buy this uh, particular security as we got the breakout just here because things were too exciting and prices were moving and you would have got a bad fill. Or maybe you'd even spotted the, uh, spotted the breakout up here and you'd say, oh gosh, I wish I'd seen that yesterday. But to keep watching this because sometimes you get a retracement and it's usually better to buy the retracement because when the trend line has been broken, it has the effect of actually reconfirming this breakout here. And you can usually buy on uh, when things are less excited so you can get a better fill. So look out for these retracements because they're excellent points in which uh, you, can, you can trade. Here we see um, another right angle triangle. And again, uh, we can draw the downtrend line. We draw it with a, a dash line. We see the breakout. But what happens is the price breaks out and pulls back again. And so it's a false triangle breakout. And what happens sometimes is these triangles turn, actually turn out to be rectangles. In this case here, we see the formation of a rectangle and a breakout to the downside. So you have to be on the, way, on, on the, um, on the lookout for the fact that triangle, rectangles are sometimes start off as triangles. Here we see a, another upside breakout. Again, it turns out to be a false one. And if we bought on the breakout to the upside, uh, the place to put the stop would have been below support, which is below, the, which is below this uh, upward sloping trend line here. Here's another example of a triangle. And here we get a downside break. And then it moves back again. So if we'd gone short here, we'd have to decide ahead of time, in case the market changes its mind, where would we place our stop? Well, one place would be just above this resistance level, because you say, well, it's a false breakout. And if it's not uh, going to follow through, then this reduces the uh, potential proof that the trend is reversed. So that might be a, a good place of putting a stop. Another possibility would be above that downtrend line there, which would be the ultimate stop point. The problem with putting it up there, of course, is the risk. Although when it breaks through there, uh, the probability of the breakdown, complete breakdown is obviously much higher. The risk of buying, of shorting here and then buying back here is much greater than here when it pulls back into the pattern. But the possibility of the pattern failing at this point here is much less than it is at that point there. So it's kind of a trade-off. Generally speaking, my view is when in doubt, get out. And uh, I would usually take this point here as my stop point. Because what I went short on is no longer in force, or appears to be no longer in force, because the price broke down and it's pulled back above this line, so it's pulled back above resistance. So I got, maybe I had four pieces of evidence that the trend had reversed. Now I'm going to take one of those pieces back. So I'm going to change the color on that from brown to green to indicate a bullish pattern. Here's another example of a failed pattern which we will see in a moment, where the pattern breaks in an unexpected direction. You can see that here is the horizontal support resistance line, and we would have expected this pattern to break to the upside. Well, in this case here, the pattern breaks to the downside. And if this is a line which has been touched on several occasions, and it's quite a long line, it tends to be a significant one. And when you get a breakdown from a situation like that, a whipsaw, uh, it's not really a whipsaw move, it's just that this was building up a series of rising peaks and troughs, uh, and here, you've got a break below this trough here. And since that peak was unable to take out these peaks here, um, that, would be a, that would be a sell signal. And it's good moving in an unexpected direction. So throughout this whole period here, you've got people expecting it to break to the upside, so they're going long. And when it finally breaks to the downside, they've got to bail out, or a lot of them got to bail out. And usually you'll get a, quite a dramatic move from one of these false breakouts, or one of these unexpected breakouts, I should say. So here's an example of a, a triangle with Alcoa. And it's a symmetrical triangle. And you can see the volume is declining during the formation and expands slightly on the breakout there. Here's an example of copper, uh, a, a right-angled triangle breaking to the downside and a consolidation pattern. And here we have the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Share Index. And you can see that it's forming a reasonably good ascending pattern here. So it's a, at this point here, it looks like a bullish ascending pattern. But it breaks to the downside. 
we're going to have to change the colors here to red uh, to indicate that that becomes a bearish pattern. And this is not unusual for when you get a breakout from an expected bullish pattern. In this case here, you get a very sharp down move. That is not unusual because people are expecting this thing to break to the upside. They position themselves that way in anticipation of the breakout. And then it starts to break to the downside. Everybody who bought in here who's a trader and has to limit their losses has got to start to bail out. And if you've got real sellers in there at the same time, that tends to push the thing down sharp, more sharply than the average decline. Here's advanced micro. We see another triangle forming here. Looks like a bullish ascending pattern. And this one here also breaks to the downside. So what you may think, you know, that, that, that this is a, a negative thing. If, you, if you've got your wits about it and you're prepared to go short, if you're looking at a failed ascending triangle and you see the breakout point here and you can get, measure a low risk, because this one would be a relatively low risk to either take it to here or even to that point there, it would re represent a, a good risk reward uh, trading opportunity, especially as failed right angle triangles tend to give you strong moves in the opposite direction to that expected. In this case here, we get huge volume on that downside breakout. And here's a reverse head and shoulders for Alcoa. And quite often what you'll find is the right shoulder of a head and shoulders pattern actually can turn out to be a triangle. It's amazing how often that happens. In that case there, we had a lot of volume. Now looking at measuring implications, here's Yahoo. And what we do is we just draw another line in here and we just move that down parallel with the lower part of the pattern there. And you can see that was our measuring objective and the price touched this on a couple of different occasions. And now we can look at the same thing looking at the normal way in which you would measure the objective. The maximum distance of the pattern, we can project that down, I think. Yep, we measure that down and look at that. It's right at that point just a little bit above where the low was. So the projection is an intelligent place for expecting the price to reverse. And if we see our oscillators and so forth and our other indicators indicating the same thing, that's again increasing the potential uh, of that point as a, as a market bottom. Here's Intel. Again, what we're looking at is a price objective. And what's interesting here is our measuring objective line intersects with the lower area of this gap just here. And here's the measuring objective using the alternative approach, which I think is a better approach. And here we see the price reaches twice the indicated objective here. And once again, there was an um, emotional day because most of the trading took place beyond the point of the high and the uh, open and the close. Again, a level of a potential support resistance level, and that was twice the objective. So you had two, piece, two reasons to expect prices to, foot, to bottom out somewhere in this, in this neighborhood. And as you can see, this was, a, this was another reason why you'd expect prices to bottom out, because we've got two lows here, and previous lows represent potential support resistance levels. So we've got lots of pieces of evidence. We have one, two, this emotional day here, plus uh, twice the objective for anticipating that could be an important low. Another triangle formed here for Intel. Uh, look at the volume, very nice volume on the breakout. And once again, we're looking at the upside objective here using the measuring line. And here we're using the maximum price objective of the, of, the, of the pattern. And that became, it went through there, but on the way back, it found support in approximately the same place as we had this upside objective here. One more triangle exam example here. We have a false breakout, and then we get a breakout to the downside. And one of the reasons why we might have expected the breakout to the downside to take place is when this little trend line here got violated. And then we see another, uh, what looked like to be a bullish right angle triangle forming here with a breakout just at that point just there. And that completely failed. And once again, uh, we got a breakout to the downside as it broke uh, below this support trend line just here. And once again, volume increasing on the downside breakout, emphasizing that downside breakout. Now we look at double tops and double bottoms and triple tops and triple bottoms. Double top is 
a point where you get uh, two rallies at approximately the same level, uh, separated by, a, obviously, a reaction. And when the price breaks below the reaction, that gives us our sell signal. And volume typically is much less intense on the second peak than it is on the first peak. And the measurement objective is taken from the higher of the two peaks and then projected down, just the same as with the other price patterns that we see. A double bottom is the opposite of a double top, where we get two bottoms at approximately the same level. The second bottom uh, experiences significantly less volume than the first. For the double bottom, the second bottom should have noticeably less volume than the first bottom. It's not just a question of a little bit less. It should be significantly less. There's an old adage on Wall Street that you should never short a dull market. Well, they're really referring to the second bottom in a double bottom formation. Because if there's less, if there's not much volume at the, at the second low, then it's indicating there's not much selling pressure. And if there's not much selling pressure, you get a few buyers come in, it could have an explosive effect on the upside. So once again, the measuring objective is taken, the maximum distance, and projected up. Another double bottom just here. And you can see that normally we would, break, we would buy on the breakout from the double bottom. But the problem is that on, one, on these double bottoms, you have a tremendous risk. Uh, unless you can find some little reaction or rally on halfway up or three quarters of the way up, it's a high risk situation because you have really not much indication that the trend is reversed if it does reverse on you. So one thing you can do is often people, what people will do is they'll buy on the breakout from a double bottom and then they'll place a stop a little bit below the 50% point. So this represents 100%. So the price comes back below this point here, which represents 50%. You place your stop below that. This is what I call a Chinese double bottom. It's a kind of a double bottom variation. Now you can see the two bottoms here. The Chinese part refers to kind of a Chinese water torture on the second bottom because prices sort of zigzag their way back in a very torturous way because people who came through this experience here, saw a lot of volume here, thought it was a selling climax, see an explosive rally, and now they're being tortured because they don't really know whether it's going to go up or down. But the Chinese double bottom gives you a great buying opportunity um, because you can buy on the breakout from this trend line here. And whereas if you buy up here, you've got a huge risk. If you buy just here, the risk is far less great because a break above the trend line confirms this as a bottom. And so you have a low risk trade with a potentially high risk reward. Same thing is true of what I call the platform double bottom. Here's the, the first bottom forms. Let me get a trading range at a higher level. That's what I call the platform. That's the second bottom. And then when the price breaks above the platform, that indicates we get the breakout from the pattern. So you could buy there. And if the platform isn't too wide, your risk is relatively low and much lower than if, with the normal double bottom, and you can place your stop below the platform. Finally, of the double bottom formations, we can look at what I call the whipsaw double bottom or the lucky seven. We get a bottom here, and we got a bottom there. Now we're looking at the waves of how this bottom is formed. So we take that away and just take a look at what's happening here. What we have is a one, two, three. So at point three, we know we have a series of rising peaks and troughs. Then what happens, the whipsaw part of it, is the price comes below number two, the bottom at number two. So now we have rising peaks, and, uh, but we have declining bottoms. This is why it's, it's a whipsaw double bottom. So that's number four. That's, that's what we call a rotten break below the previous low. Then what happens is we get another wave up and another wave down, five and six. And that's why I call it a, seven, um, a lucky seven, because the seventh wave is the one that tells you that it really is a true double bottom. And at this point here, where the green line is at x, you can now see we have a series of rising peaks and troughs. They're now reconfirmed. And that's one point for entering the trade. And the second point would be above the, uh, the third wave at point y. That would, that would confirm the pattern as a lucky seven, double bottom. And I'll show an example of this a little later. So here we see a double top forming. And uh, here's the price objective. Measure it down. Measure it down again. And that becomes the point at which that low forms temporarily. Measure it down again. 
Nothing really happening there. Just a little consolidation. Then we look at Lockheed, another double bottom here. And you can see that there's a reverse head and shoulders forming just there. And uh, first bottom contains, uh, uh, it's associated with a lot of volume. And the second bottom is obviously noticeably less volume at that point there, confirming the double bottom formation. Here's a Chinese double bottom. And you can see we're drawing in the, uh, the, two, the, the two volumes at the two lows. But look what happens when uh, we get the breakout from the uh, Chinese tortured line. You get very high volume on the breakout and, and represents a great place, although you don't know what's going to happen after this, the break above here is a great place for going long because your risk is only down to here, as opposed to buying here where there's nowhere, there's no obvious place where you could place a stop because there's no obvious support point. And just to take a 50% retracement move uh, as your stop point would be quite, quite uh, difficult too. So a better entry point is on the breakout from this uh, torture trend line here. Here's another example of a Chinese double bottom. This time the, the torture trend line is even more torturous because it's coming down at a slower and slower pace. Uh, and there's the entry point just there. And there would be the risk down to just a little bit below that blue arrow. And then we see another double bottom here with a price objective. And that's where the price eventually gets to. Doesn't do it in the first move. It comes back and makes a retracement. Then it comes up again and then back and then tries again for the third time. Here's another double top, but then the question is, is it a double top? Uh, you, certainly you've got one top separated by the other top, and one first has much higher volume than the second one, but is it a right angle triangle? It, you know, in my view, it doesn't really matter. The fact is it's showing signs of a peak, whether you call it a double top or you call it a triangle because the second top isn't as high as the first top, it really doesn't matter. What it indicates is a change in psychology. So don't worry about the label you're giving to this pattern. Worry about whether the pattern really reflects a, a change in psychology going on. And that definitely does in this situation just here. So once again, the triangle is formed with a series of declining uh, peaks in, in volume. And now here we see a, a, a lucky seven. Here's, here's the two bottoms, one bottom here and the second bottom here. So we see a rise. At this point, number three, it looks bullish because we have a series of rising peaks and troughs. Then this trough is violated, so it's a little bit in doubt. Then we get five and six, uh, and six stays above four. And then when we get to seven, halfway through seven, we go above the peak in five at this point just here. And that indicates uh, the lucky seven bottom is being completed. And that's the initial buy signal. And then a the higher risk buy signal would be at that point there when the price takes out uh, the peak at number three. That offers strong confirmation. So here's two double bottoms again. Once again, we got three waves, three waves up, indicating rising peaks and troughs. The fourth wave takes you below the second wave, indicating the doubt. And then you get a rise at five and a, and a decline at six, but six is above four, and then seven goes above five indicating we now have a series of rising peaks and troughs. These patterns are not that, not that uh, plentiful, but when you see them, you often get this dramatic uh, rally that takes place. And it's probably because you've got all this whipsawing activity in here, which confuses everybody. And it, it's uh, confusing enough to keep, keep people short during this whole period here. And then eventually the thing, and they expect more of the same, and then it, it, it breaks to the upside there. So that would be the initial buy point just there, and then the confirmation would come much higher. But obviously, at this point here, it's a much better buying situation um, because the risk, you would probably risk to this low, just below this minor low here. Now for triple tops, a uh, triple top is where you have three tops at approximately the same level, and followed by a line where you can draw a valley underneath, um, and that becomes a bearish line when penetrated. But you've got to be careful because a triple top could turn out to be a head and shoulders top if that middle top is higher than two other tops. 
So there we go back to the double top again, where they're approximately the same level. Again, we can look at it a different way, and if the tops are all the same, too, too close to each other, it becomes a rectangle. And then finally, we could have a series of declining tops, which were still a triple top in a way, but if they're too far, too separated by too far, that becomes um, a declining triangle. This is what a, a triple top should look like. But again, it doesn't really matter what you call these things. The question is, is the pattern bullish or bearish? Is it a good example of a bearish pattern where you have a battle between buyers and sellers which are resolved on the downside in favor of sellers? And the answer here is, yes, it is. A triple bottom is the exact opposite of a triple top. We get two, three bottoms at approximately the same level. And the measuring implications are exactly the same. Here we see three tops and a break to the downside. And here is a kind of a triple bottom just here. Uh, not much volume on the upside. Now broadening formations, which are my favorite chart pattern, because they are followed by very strong moves, uh, much stronger moves proportionately than uh, other patterns. In other words, if we get a three-week head and shoulders, um, which indicates a 20% move, you get a broadening formation, it tends to be more like a 30 or 40% move. There are two types of broadening formation. The first is what we call the orthodox broadening formation, which is exactly the opposite of a triangle, where with a triangle we have two lines which are converging, with the broadening formation they're diverging. When I was doing my research for this price pattern book I was telling you about, what I found was that there are very few examples in the charts of broadening formations, orthodox broadening formations, where the lines are diverging. And the other thing is that when you want to get out of this thing or go short, you're so far away from the natural stop point that um, it, it makes the risk reward untenable. So I tend not to use these orthodox broadening formations even when I find them. Uh, and, and in order to make them worthwhile, you have, they have to be followed by a very, very long uptrend. Uh, otherwise, if they're not, then there's not much to reverse at the point when the pattern is completed. And since the risk is so high, it makes the risk reward, as I mentioned, um, untenable. So here we have the second type, which I think is a very much more reliable pattern and a much more useful and um, popular pattern. This is a broadening formation with a flat bottom. So we see, two, again, two diverging lines, but this is, in fact, the opposite of a right angle triangle, where we have a series of rising peaks and the troughs are approximately the same level. It can be joined by a horizontal line. When you get a breakout to the downside, it tends to give you an above average move. Price objective is the same, taking the maximum distance of the pattern and projecting it downwards. Then at the bottom, we have a broadening formation with a flat top, and the upper line is horizontal, and the other line is joining a series of lows. And the falling trend line approximately joins the declining bottoms. Measure an objective the same, maximum distance, projected upwards. Volume configurations, obviously, uh, we want to see um, prices uh, moving up with expanding volume on the breakout. And this is the approximately sh approximate shape. It's a kind of a, a reverse type triangle there. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the lines when you draw them are, are approximate. But think of it as this shape. And then if we look at the price configuration underneath, you can see how it, how it all works out. And what I think one of the reasons why this pattern tends to be strong when it, you get the breakout is that it, follow, it tends to follow a long bear market or a long bear trend. And we get people who uh, have been going short all the way through, and they get very enthusiastic about going short, because every time they go short and get a rally, they can make money. And then people who are going long get more and more discouraged. So at this point here, we have the give up point. We have everybody who's really enthusiastic about being short because they've made money every time the price has come down. And you've got the people who are long who get totally um, uh, depressed about the whole thing and then finally liquidate at that point. So when it breaks through the previous, the next high at this point here, all the people who are short are forced to cover. And at the same time, there's probably some good, some good news coming out, so they get new longs coming into the market. And that's what tends to give you that very, very sharp rise through uh, the resistance level. And it's kind of like a, res a reverse head and shoulders where you don't have enough time to, make, to form that right shoulder. You're in such a hurry to be bullish and push prices higher. There's a consolidation broadening formation just there. And here's a couple of examples. Here's Intel. Uh, again, the two diverging lines of broadening formation with a flat bottom. Normally, I would, I would expect to see a much sharper and longer decline take place from a pattern such as this. 
But in this case here, I use this example to show the, the measuring objective. And here's another example. And this, this is more typical, where you get a pretty prolonged uh, decline following the formation of the pattern. And in this case here, it well exceeds the downside price objective. Here's an example of the US dollar, totally different to what's happening today, of course. Uh, during 1979, 1980, the dollar formed a broadening formation with a flat top. And again, uh, these lines are, are drawn approximately to indicate this kind of level of resistance and this level of support. Sometimes you can't really join these trend lines so they actually touch exactly like with the other patterns. But in this case here, look how many times the objective was achieved. One, two, three, four, five, six times. 500, sorry, five times, 500% 500 of the objective. And that's, again, not unexpected from a pattern like this. Here, looking at the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Share Index, again, a nice broadening formation with, followed by a very substantial rally. Now we'll take a quick look at broadening wedges. A broadening wedge is just the same as a broadening formation with a flat bottom or a flat top, except that one of the, the, the flat part is at a slight angle. The lines are still diverging. So the first line rises for a top, and the second line rises too. But because the second, the lower line is rising at a less fast pace than the upper line, they're still diverging. And that's how we get the diverging, the broadening wedge. And that's equally as powerful as, as if that line was at a horizontal level. So here we see a broadening wedge again. And that's how it differs from an orthodox broadening formation, because the orthodox broadening formation would have a, the second line would be coming down. In the broadening wedge, both lines are going up, one line at a less fast pace than the other. Here's a broadening um, wedge at a bottom. Same, same idea here as the, the upper line. This time is falling at a slower rate than the lower line, but they're still diverging. And when it breaks out, it gives you a strong signal. Here's an example. It's a broadening wedge just here with a breakdown. And that's followed by a reverse head and shoulders. But you can see the kind of dramatic declines that can take place in these broadening patterns. One more example just here. And again, a pretty dramatic decline, far exceeding the minimum downside price objective. And notice the, uh, the bottom, the double bottom at the bottom with the kind of the selling climax back in early July. And then the less volume on the, uh, substantially less volume on the second bottom. Now we've got uh, the giant wedge. A giant wedge takes place over a fairly long period of time. Uh, it usually forms, and it can encompass a whole bull market or a whole bear market. The idea here is that we have two lines which this time are converging as the price goes up. So the trading range gets narrower and narrower as the bull market develops. And then you get the breakout from the wedge on the downside. And you tend to get fairly dramatic moves when that happens. And same thing in reverse on the downside. You have a, a bear market lasting six months to 18 months. And then you can draw two converging lines, indicating the balance between buyers and sellers is gradually getting less and less intense. And then finally, you get the breakout to the upside. And that's usually followed by a pretty explosive advance. Here's an example. Here we can see a long-term year, a year and a half decline, two converging lines, and a dramatic break to the upside. Measuring objectives are, again, the maximum distance of the pattern projected upward from the breakout point. So this time, we, our breakout is in the opposite direction to the measuring objective. And we see the same thing here on the downside, where we have a downside uh, wedge. Here's our measuring objective, and there we project it up. The final example of this is Intel. And it's a four-month wedge in this case. There's our measuring objective. And then, of course, in this case here, it's of one, two, three, four times the measuring objective. Our final pattern is cup and handles, um, made famous by William O'Neill. The idea here is that we have a sharp rally accompanied by a very heavy volume and then a sharp decline. And then we get a recovery and we get a kind of a platform. 
and the platform is the handle. So there's the cup, the, the U shape, and then the handle is the little trading range. And it's a consolidation pattern, and it's very important on the breakout for volume to expand significantly. And it's usually followed by very heavy volume, a very, a very sharp price move. Here's a variation here where the cup becomes more of a flat bottom or trading range bottom, and the breakout above the handle uh, comes a little bit later, again on, on heavy volume. Important for the volume to break to the upside there. Here's an example in the marketplace, ADC Telecom, and that line there represents the approximate uh, outline of the cup and handle. You notice that there is rally here and there's a lot of fair de degree of volume on this, on, this, on this point just here. So that becomes the cup, that decline there, and then that trading range there at a higher level becomes the handle, and then the breakout takes place above the handle, and we get a pretty good rally. This, these patterns tend to give you very nice rallies uh, once they break out to the upside. Here again, we see the uh, approximate um, outline of the cup and handle. And in this case here, we have the cup as the decline. Notice the volume on the left, just here, very heavy on that rally. Then we have the, the handle, which is really nothing more than a consolidatory trade range, trading range as they test the lows of the cup, or the lows formed at the cup, and then you get the breakout from the handle, and again, on very good volume and very good sharp rally. In this case here, you could maybe mis uh, relabel the pattern and call it a reverse head and shoulders. Again, I uh, emphasize the fact it doesn't really matter what you call these patterns. It's a question of what the underlying psychology is and what happens on the breakout, whether it's a good or valid pattern or not. So that completes what I have to say on uh, price patterns. Thank you very much.